Again, my name is John Singer. I'm a professor here at Jackson Community College. The light, I'm going to ask that you put the things down for a second because you've got to hear me out for that for a short time. What I have here are some white powders. And so here's the scenario the body's been found. Next to the body, some white powder. And I'm trying to figure out what killed the person. And your job is to figure out what the white powder is, what commercial analgesic substance the white powder is. So here's what I'd like you to do. Yes, question. Go ahead. Okay. What I want you to do is to pick one for, I'm going to pass this around, pick one of these out for each of you, or if you're with the small kids, share these with somebody uh, so that you each get one. Do not open them yet. Just set them out in front of you. They've got numbers on them. They're coded. So take one and pass it around. Okay, the method that we're going to use for analyzing this stuff is something called thin layer chromatography. And chromatography is a separation technique. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you, how many of you have ever seen the Costner movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? Anybody ever seen that? Okay, how many of you, how many of you have ever seen, I'm curious about this one, Great Heart, No Gibson, anybody seen that? Did any of you watch any of the Viking series that was on recently on History Channel? Anybody see anything like that? Okay, in all those series, in all those series, in all those programs, they showed a glimpse of they showed a glimpse of life in what is known as feudal England, feudal society. And in feudal society, the wealthy, the rich people owned the land, and the majority of people lived on the land as what they called sharecroppers or serfs, and they worked the land. And each year they were taxed. In agricultural societies, there were taxed the king would come and take his take of the crops. Now, I'm going to let you finish passing those around. Okay, I'm glad you got your lucky number. No, oh, you didn't get your lucky number. Maybe. Well, kind of yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, now, How many of you heard the story of Robin Hood? Let me ask you that one. Okay. In Robin Hood's story, he realized that you know, he got from the rich and gave to the poor. And the reason he did was because the majority of the people that lived on the land were the poor. And back in his time, way back in his time, there was a king who owned a section of land, a large section of the countryside in northern England. This guy's name was Rupert. And Rupert was a sporting man. He was into the sports of his time. If you go back to those times, the sports of those times were things like the equestrian sports, horseback riding, the martial arts. And I'm not talking about the Bruce Lee martial arts. I'm talking about the martial arts of those times, the ability to operate certain weapons like the lance, shields, uh, archery. He was also very strong. He was into wrestling. And as a king, as a king, he had a lot of leisure time to develop skills at these sports. Because he could develop skills at these sports, there was nobody, nobody that lived in his kingdom that could best him at his sports. And he became dejected, he became depressed about this. And the reason why he was depressed was because he was the one that had such skills, there was nobody that could compete with him. And so one day he met with his court and he said to his court, I want to do something. And here's what I want to do. I want to find the ten strongest men that live in the villages of my kingdom. I want them to leave the sharecropper's life, come live in the king's palace, come live in the castle, have access to all the king's wealth, and to become my bodyguards and sporting companions. When he did this, his court went ballistic. They said, there is absolutely no way you can do this. And the reason why you can't is because the people that live in this kingdom are incredibly poor. And because they're poor, there will be rioting in the streets. And there was an accountant by the name of Chromos, they came up with this idea. Chromos said there was a swift river which flowed through the kingdom and flowed out to the North Sea. And 
he said, here's what we will do. We will send out teams of woodcutters and engineers. They will identify places along the river where trees grow, grow close to the river. We'll have the woodcutters cut down the trees. We'll fell them so that they lay across the river. river. We'll remove their limbs and their bark. And we'll dig them down into the river at right angles to the swift flowing current. Then what we'll do is we'll take any man that thinks he is among the 10 strongest men in his kingdom, we'll place them in the river at point X. We'll allow them to drift downstream, and as they drift downstream, when they encounter a log across the river, they'll be able to reach up and grasp that log. They'll hold on to the log until the current causes them to weaken and fatigue, and then they'll release the log, and they'll begin to drift downstream, and one of two things will happen. Either they will be able to rest and regain their strength, or they will weaken, drown, and die. We'll take the 10 men that get to point Y, the last 10 men that get to point Y, alive, those will be the 10 strongest men in the kingdom. This means of separation and identification of the components of a mixture by the use of a local phase, the moving current, and a stationary phase, the logs, to be called chromatography after chromos. I made that story up, that's all I can see. But anyway, you'll not forget what chromatography is. What chromatography is, is it's a means of separation. You make the means. Means, separation of the, of the components of a mixture. With both a mobile phase and a stationary phase. And what you're going to do is you're going to do something called thin layer chromatography. Now, in thin layer chromatography, what we're going to do is we're going to separate the components of a mixture. Why don't you take the handouts that you have here, go to the second page. Take it, open them up to the second page, and look at the top of the second page there. There is a table there. You don't have one? I don't know. Have to be someone here. Still have some left. I'm hoping with some of the small children, some of the adults can help them with some of the prep that they're going to do and then they get to it. Okay, how many of you have one of those little blocks? How many do? How about blocks? Vials, those things, yes. Okay, what's happening here is that those are set the vials down. Those vials contain, they contain um, one of the commercial drugs that's listed on the second page of the printed materials there. They contain either buffering, Motrin IV, Anacin, Tylenol, or extra strength, etc. These drug substances, these are, if you look, their ingredients are listed to the right. Aspirin. Uh, is composed, our buffer is composed of just aspirin. Motrin IV is ibuprofen, or IV is for ibuprofen. Anacin is actually a mixture. It's got aspirin and some caffeine in it. And then Tylenol is a single substance, it's acetaminophen. And then extra strength, etc. is a mixture of three things. It's got acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. And what we're going to do in this activity is we're going to separate and identify the components of a mixture so that you can identify which commercial drug is in that vial that you have in front of you there. Now, in order to do this, you're going to prepare something called a chromatogram. In thin layer chromatography, all chromatography uses a mobile phase and a stationary phase. In thin layer chromatography, the stationary phase is going to be a piece of chromatographic plate. These are the chromatographic plates here. The chromatographic plate is a piece of plastic acetate. On one side of the acetate is a material called silica gel. And silica gel is a material which can absorb certain things. And as you see, the now in the because it's pretty tough to understand otherwise. And what you're going to do with this is you're going to prepare this plate by, and I need you to write some things down. You have pencils or something to write with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anywhere you want. Anybody need pencils? There are pencils up here. Yeah. 
Yes, that's yours. Okay, if you need a pencil, come here. Okay. 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 Okay.
uh, capillary tubes. The way to prepare those glass capillary tubes, we're going to have to pull them with a Bunsen burner. I'm going to show you how to even do a little bit of glass burner. I thought it would be kind of fun for most people to do, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the burners, the way they work, take a look at this. They have two controls on them. There's a dial on the bottom. It's a star dial. I've taken that star dial and righty tighty lefty loosey. I'm going to close it completely. It's now closed. I'm going to open it up two complete turns. One half, one and a half, or one, one and a half, two. The other control is this control right here that lets air into the bird. And what that does is the barrel, if I unscrew this, air gets past these little windows here, puts more air into the flame. What I'm going to do to light a bunch of burger, I'm going to close that. I close that first. I open up the start dial on the bottom to complete turns like I just did. The gas is on in the lab. I'm going to use the striker here to light this. And the way the strikers work, they've got a flint on them. And when that flint goes across that file, it sparks and lights. And this is where adults are going to help us. We turn the flame on. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to adjust the flame until it's about six or eight inches tall. Now, right there, that flame, I want you to see something about it. That flame is what's called a luminous flame. It's got a lot of color to it. We'll shut the lights down so you can see it better, actually, when I change things. Give it about six or eight inches tall. And then I'm going to open up this dial here and we'll let some air into that flame. As I let air into the flame, the flame turns from an orange to a blue color. When it turns blue, the flame is very clean. It doesn't have a lot of soot coming out of it. It's a more efficient flame and it's actually a hotter flame. At the same time, the center of the flame has no heat. This is an unlit match in my hand. I'm going to take it and I'll put it into the flame. The match stick will burn, but the match head doesn't. If I do it right, I'll do it again. Okay, hold on. I'll put that in there. The match stick's burning. The match head doesn't burn until I get up to the top of the flame. The tip of the flame is the hot point. You can't see it now, can you? In the light? The reason you can't see it easily in the light is because it's a clean flame. It's still there. Okay, and this is why we have to have adults help us here. Okay, this is a glass capillary tube. What we need to do with these glass capillary tubes to make them a little thinner. And here's how this happens. I'm going to take it, I'm going to describe this to you, I'm going to put it into the flame. I'm going to twirl it in the flame. As I twirl it in the flame, the flame is going to turn orange again because there's something called sodium coming out of the glass. Watch. I put it in the flame, I twirl it. As the glass heats up, see how it turns yellow orange? Okay, that's the glass softening. When the glass softens, I'm going to take it out of the flame, and I'm going to pull it. Watch. Softens, take it out of the flame, and I pull it. We'll do it one more time.
You're going to take one of the capillary tubes for each of those. You're going to dip it into. Put those down, please. You're going to dip it into the solid that has some of this stuff dissolved in it. The capillary tube will draw it up inside. When it draws it up inside, then you're going to take your chromatographic plate. Where you've got the pencil mark. This is aspirin. I'm going to touch this right to the point on aspirin. And I'm going to allow the solvent to draw from the capillary tube onto the silica gel plate. Do that three to five times. And what you want to do is you want to build a small spot of material on the plate at that point. So you're going to do it for caffeine, or for aspirin, caffeine, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and two unknowns at each table. And no more than two. I know I have several of you have. They're all the You're going to have to share them. Okay, once that's done, then the plate is ready to go into chromatic. To do that, the cabinet in front of you is a beaker and a watch glass. Back here in the fume hood, something called the developing solvent. What happens here is that line that you drew there one centimeter from the bottom. You're going to put a half centimeter, half that amount, into that beaker. When you put it into the beaker, then you're going to stand in the beaker like this. And what's going to happen is that solvent will climb up the beaker, that's a mobile phase, the silica gel is a stationary phase, and it's going to cause those materials that you placed in that line to move. So, what happens with this? To illustrate it is this. You're going to have a beaker. You're going to have a half centimeter of the solvent. You're going to stand the chromatographic plate in there, and that will be up one centimeter. This stuff is going to start to rise along the plate. As it rises along the plate, it's going to move toward the top of this plate here. You let it sit in there until it comes to about a centimeter or so from the top. When it does, when it's within one centimeter of the top, you take it out, you stop it, and you mark that line. That is the solvent front. And then, this group, what we're going to do then, is we're going to go develop those plates you're going to look at. And here's how this works. Each of these substances is going to move depending on whether it is attracted more to the moving solid or the silica gel. And each of those substances will deposit somewhere on the plate. I don't know where. You're going to visualize them. I'll tell you how in a second. And when you see them, you're going to draw a pencil line around them. And then your unknowns look at the list of unknowns on the second page. Your unknowns are going to do the same thing. And you'll be able to tell if your unknown contains one or more of these substances by where it deposits on the plate. For instance, if you have unknown number seven and it has a spot right here, what is unknown number seven? I do. You. Right? And so you'll be able to identify what the drug was that was left in the France question. I, I think I've done something somewhat similar to this. Yes. With like a marker, a paper towel, and water. Yeah, that's called paper chromatography. Yes. Anybody else? Question? Um, do we just put the powder on it? No, that part i got to explain to you. <laughs> okay, you have one of these things. Hold on a second. Let me answer this question. You have one of these things in front of you. It's called a micro spot plate. You have a small scoop here. What you do is you put small scoop of that powder into one of these larger wells here and then you add to that I'll put this on the front table so it doesn't get mixed up you add to that a little bit of ethanol alcohol, this alcohol and then swirl it a little bit and then we're going to apply that to the plate just like you did the gnomes thank you for asking that question yes. um, can it be made to protect yourself when we damage to your eyes, you don't want to damage your eyes. And everybody in here would be required to wear goggles. And if we're short goggles, I would get some. Can I have you go to the lab next door and get some? Just go uh, right over here next door. Try to get through here, be the easiest. 
question here. Um, what happens if it contains more than one or two? If it contains more than one, then what you try to do is to identify how many they contain. If you look at the list of unknowns, the most they can have is three. So they're either going to have one, two, or three substances in there. And based on that, you should be able to identify which of these it is. Will it have Three separate spots that show up here if it is for instance the extra strength of the seven. Yes. Yes, question. Um, what happens if you have a problem with like a beaker or this? Uh we'll work it out. Very good. Okay. Okay. Good? Okay. Now, over here. When you have it, have the uh, stuff done and you take it out of the solvent, what I want you to do is I want you to dry the excess solvent off. While it's wet, mark the solvent front so you can see it. Then take and dry the excess solvent off with the blow dryer back here in the hood. Dry it off back here. Once you've got it dried off, then you bring it over to this thing. And we're going to have to do this quickly. It looks like we'll set up probably uh, one for each table, a total of six. And this gives off some ultraviolet light. And what happens here is these plates have a fluorescence material. And I want you to see this. Can you see it from your side? This glows green. And what that'll do, it'll allow you to spot those spots on there. The background here will grow, grow low green, and each of the spots will appear as a shadow. Now, do you have any questions before you start? Yes? Uh, can you show that again? Okay, I'll let you see it when you come over here then. That's great. Okay? Any others? Okay. Just want the adults to do the I think the adults should probably help with the buns and burgers at each of the tables, yes. I think that would be safe. <laughs> like I said, I expected that there'd be adults here for the kids. Any other questions? Let's get started, get this going, and I'll help you out here as we go. So, let's do that. Can you help you like that? Can you help you like
You see nothing.